Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Liz Granite. I have the pleasure of serving on the board of directors of One Book, One New Orleans. And I'm excited that we could gather together tonight in celebration of the freedom to read this banned books week. And tonight we get to discuss what are incarcerated people permitted to read, what books are banned from jails and prisons, and why, and what obstacles do educators working in adult and juvenile prisons face? And for those of you who are joining a one book event for the first time, let me tell you a little bit about what we do. For those who are coming back, thank you so much. Glad you could be here tonight. So One Book, One New Orleans selects one book each year, and we encourage everybody in the city to read that same book at the same time with the intention that we're going to grow stronger as a community through our shared reading experience. And in fulfilling that mission, we have to recognize that the functional literacy rate among adults in our city is approximately 27%. So we do extra layers of outreach to make sure that when we say we are one book, one New Orleans, we really mean it. And we do this by developing a curriculum around each year's selected book, and we get that book into adult education programs, both in Orleans Parish, as well as uh, six other parishes throughout Louisiana. So the selected book each year is used to teach people to read. And in addition, we also get it both into adult and juvenile prisons, and we get the book into the ears of the blind and print disabled thanks to a partnership with WRBH Reading Radio for the blind. Finally, for those who love to read yet may not have the resources to purchase books, we remove that barrier by making sure that every branch of the New Orleans Public Library has a copy of each year's selected book. And this year, our 2021 selection is The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom. And if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. We still have lots more programming coming this year. And in a moment, we're going to hear from some really incredible people offering really valuable insight um, on this topic of banned books. Tonight, we get to hear from Miriam Henderson Olohu, founder and director of Sister Hearts Decarceration Program, Byron Goodwin, a founding member of the Travis Hill Schools and Break Free Education and the director of schools, and Susanna Rosenthal from Louisiana Books to Prisoners. Tonight's discussion will be led by Candace Huber, and Candace is a sixth generation New Orleanian who owns New Orleans' premier geeky, queer, progressive, and genre focused bookstore, Tubby and Coo's Midge City Bookshop, named after their grandparents. Candace serves on the National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, Science Fiction and Fantasy Task Force, which sounds like a lot of fun, and the Independent Bookstore Day Advisory Committee for the American Booksellers Association, and is a writing, editing, publishing, and virtual event consultant. They are often behind many of our One Book, One New Orleans events, um, behind the scenes, making it all happen for us. They are also helping to develop the store operations module for the professional bookseller certification program. In the before times, they hosted the Writers Forum on WRBH Reading Radio, focusing on interviewing science fiction and fantasy authors. Candace established Tales Publishing in 2018, which has thus far published three books, with the fourth coming this fall, a role-playing game supplement called Carnival of Creatures, focusing on Louisiana monsters of myth and legend. And if you're not following the Tubby and Coos Instagram, you got to get on it. Your, your reading list will thank you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Candice to get our Banned Books Week celebration, Banned Behind Bars, started. Thank you so much, Candice. Thank you, Liz, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here this evening to moderate this panel. Um, and I'm actually going to let everyone introduce themselves, Megan, if you want to bring everyone on. I, I am excited um, this evening to have Byron and Miriam and Susanna with me. Hello, everyone. And uh, I would like to just go around and have, uh, I got a wonderful introduction from Liz. So I want you all to introduce yourselves and tell us about you and what you do and your organizations. 
So Byron, you want to go first? Yes. Thank you, Candace. My name is Byron Goodwin, and I am the director of Travis Hill School. I work under Break Free Education, and my job is to provide education to young adults and juveniles inside of the correction facility. So we operate out of the Orleans Justice Center and the Juvenile Intervention Center, which is the Juvenile Center. I've been with Break Free for the last six years, and I love the work that I do. That's amazing. Susanna, you're next on my screen. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a part of Louisiana Books to Prisoners. Uh, we're an all-volunteer collective uh, sending free reading materials to incarcerated people uh, in prison, jail, and um, ICE facilities now in, in Louisiana, Alabama, and Arkansas. Um, our service area has changed um, based on our capacity. I'm excited to be here with all of you today. Thanks. Awesome. And for Banned Books Week, uh, Louisiana Books to Prisoners actually has a wish list. So uh, if you want to support and buy things off the wish list, it is in partnership with my bookstore, Chubby and Coos. Uh, and if you go to our bookshop site, you can find that, which maybe Megan can put a link in the chat. I'll, I'll put it in the private chat and Megan can link it in the real chat. And then y'all can go buy stuff off of it for Books to Prisoners. So thank you, Susanna. And Miss Miriam. My name is Marion Uloho, and I'm the CEO and founder of Sister Hearts, Inc. And we have a thrift store that we, uh, we use for decarceration. I myself spent almost 13 years in prison, and as a result, I was traumatized. So we now have a place where people returning home from, from society can come to to help reverse the trauma of incarceration. But first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for having me on this panel. It is truly an honor. Thank you. I'm, we're, I'm really glad to have you all here. So it is Banned Books Week this week. And so this uh, conversation is going to focus on uh, books that are banned in in prisons and jails and the difficulty of, of getting books there. So I guess the first question, I, I'm going on a, a baseline that people really don't know anything about any of this. So, um, so my first question to all of you is, what are the some of the prison like restrictions on allowable content? Like what do prisons not allow there? And why? Like, what is what is sort of their definition? It, in looking at this, it all seemed very arbitrary. So I want to hear <laughs> all of you uh, uh, why uh, about what things are banned and why they are banned. Whoever wants to go first can take that. <laughs> oh, and I'm also curious uh, as to what the differences are between adults and um, and and juveniles and and things that are banned there as well. So go ahead. Uh, well, I can go ahead and speak to um, restrictions and bans we face um, sending to adult facilities. Um, uh, I guess I should start um, in case people aren't familiar with us by mentioning that we, uh, we receive letters from people who are incarcerated and with a a book or genre request, um, and we do our best to fill um, fill a request and send them a package of books um, to that individual person. Um, and uh, there are some like really basic restrictions, uh, even just to start, and that's that uh, a lot of um, prisons don't accept hardcover books. Um, some like Angola don't accept used books. Uh, and um, then getting into more specifics about the books themselves, um, there can be some general, general things like um, depictions of weapons or explicit uh, material on the cover, things 
like, like that. But, but, um, but, but the big thing that, that we're facing is that it's not, I mean, you can see this banned book books and you can't send them to us. Um, it's all very um, arbitrary. Um, uh, we didn't have access to a banned book list until a journalist was able to have access to it a few years ago um, for Louisiana. Um, you know, other states have, have different experiences uh, with that. Um, and we find that a lot of it just comes down to who's working in the mailroom, um, their relationship with who the books might be going to, or um, their idea of what's acceptable, um, and, and not so much like based on the the, the list of specific titles. Um, so we're working from this uh, vague um, response where like we send things out and then we get things back and we extract information from from what we're getting back um, sometimes with an explanation and sometimes without um, so that's just a, a general overview well that sounds one super frustrating and also what is it with used books like why why used books <laughs> well um Often, yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't know what the, the current explanation for that requirement is. Um, often justifications for restrictions are um, about contraband, suggesting that there's contraband coming in through books. Um, data does not back this up as a, a frequent occurrence. Uh, in fact, um, in Washington State in 2019, the uh, Washington Department of Justice um, cited uh, some changes in allowing books based on 17 instances of contraband. Um, but uh, after um, a public records search, uh, that was just all the instances were due to a, a bad data search, like a database search that was in error. And so things with the word book in them or something came up and they had nothing to do with books coming from prison book programs. So we're seeing things like that happening where it's not actually based on, on occurrences, but we're being kind of scapegoated for, um, you know, for things coming in when that's just, a, you know, we're not a big source of, of that kind of occurrence. So just reminds me of like in movies when you see like they cut the pages out of the book and put the contraband. It's like that's not a real thing, right? <laughs> so but that's what they it makes it sound like, right? Like these restrictions make it seem like that's what people are doing. And it's like, no, no, that's you know, only yeah. in movies. Anyway. <laughs> well, the the other I mean, Angola is uh does allow us to send new books, but um the other thing is there's a big move. Um you know, there's money to be made. Uh, and and so there's a move toward um, only allowing certain vendors, uh, books to come in through certain vendors, uh, which greatly limits access. Um, I think, uh, was it in Pennsylvania or New York? I can't remember now, but I think maybe it was New York State. The, uh, the There were five vendors proposed to allow books and the total number of books was just over a hundred books. I mean, that's like such a limited variety. I think 20 of them were coloring books, you know, like that's, that's not a variety of reading materials available to people, but that that's stemming from, um, uh, these vendor relationships where there's an outside, you know, private company that people are, um, you know, we're, but groups like ours are constantly fighting um, against those trends. Great. Well, thank you. And Byron, tell us about the, um, the, the juvenile sort of version of this and what is and isn't allowed there. So inside the juvenile facility, the only books that are not allowed are hardback books. Um, the other books, they 
don't band because we correlated with the education. So we are able to incorporate it into the different lessons. So whether it's English, math. So right now we have kids learning like stock exchange, um, doing those type of things. Our goal is to change and uh, erase some of this recidivism. So what we do is take the negative output. So that would be um, criminal books, um, books of um, maybe like a sexual nature and teach them the value in the right way of those books. So the goal is to help them change their mindset from doing the things that they were doing as they came in. So from a school perspective, we do those things to help get them back engaged into the regular school community when they leave us. So, I mean, we do sex ed through physical education, but it's done in a way where it's healthy and it's not uh, inappropriate. Um, the one thing that we they don't allow per se is like news articles when kids are trying to look up like crimes, who committed these crimes, so forth and so on. So that's probably like the biggest thing that they try not to have the kids read, but we get creative and use it in history and English to help them see it and understand how not to get into that life and how to change from it. You know, we, we do compare it and contrast with them. That's awesome. I love that getting creative <laughs> and, uh, and finding ways to like put it into their education. I think that's, that's really great. So there are no specific content bands then um, y'all kind of just, plug it into their education curriculum. So that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's, and like I say, that's from the school side. So our autonomy is a little different on the facility side. They may have certain restrictions of what can come in, but because we attach all our stuff to that educational component, we, 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 you know, we get creative. So it, it and if we didn't get creative, they probably would, stop most of our stuff as well. So we get creative and, and attach them to the lesson plans and the, the different units within the, the school. So, and, and attach it to the state standards. So. Yeah, I do know that there's a similar, oh, well, I, I, I donate books to the juvenile justice center. And I know that there's a similar requirement in that they can't have hardbacks. Yes. Um, but that's the only thing that I know of. They, they have not turned down any books that I've tried to send them. So no. I don't, you know, so that's good. <laughs> um, and Miriam, tell us about this a little bit from your perspective, um, from being an, an incarcerated person and how that was for you in, in trying to get books. Okay. Now, you know, I need to be, let it be known that I'm, I'm going to be very transparent because uh, I'm not coming from any other point of view other than an institutionalized mindset. And so I want to make sure that everybody's very clear on that because, you know, sometimes that can be offensive to other people. But I want to, you mentioned several things that I wanted to address. Packages that comes in, that like when I send books to a, a lot of the inmates now, I can send them from my store, which is a thrift store, but we have to have the stamp. So I had to have a, a professional stamp that stamps the books versus handwriting to say the name of my organization. I'm not sure what that means, but that's what we had to do, okay? The other thing too is I uh, I could put stamps on the package, but I've come to realize that they prefer when the post office gives me the, the stamps, you know, the white label from the post office, they prefer that. Now, I'm not going to be in denial and act like, you know, all inmates are, are saints because that's not how they work. A lot of times there's drugs under the stamps and you, you, you can do a lot of things, you know, and, and I was on the side where I saw a lot of things take place. And so I have a very good understanding of 
why correction officers are needed, why the discipline, I clearly understand because we are dehumanized, demoralized, and desensitized in prison. So if you dehumanize people, then how are you expecting them to have the moral sensitivity that we're supposed to have as human beings? We're behaving and we're coming strictly from a dehumanized, animalistic uh, mentality, mindset. The other thing is with the used book, um, Suzanne was talking about why they can't you have used books. Well, I'm going to just share a different light because a lot of times, now I send used books all the time because we're from a thrift store. And so I just send the books because that's all I have. But a lot of times when you have really hardened criminals that are extremely uh, thorough with their criminal wisdom, messages can be sent inside used books because we can underline certain words and we could tell talk about escape and all kinds of things we could tell you uh and 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 mr god goodwin up there he can confirm what i'm saying we could send all kinds of messages to hurt your staff to hurt another inmate we could send messages to do all kinds of things through used books now the COs, it's their job to be able to decipher stuff like that. But I'm just telling you from an inmate point of view that that's one of the reasons that uh, the used book is such a big deal sometimes. And then the, the contraband that can come in through books, period, whether it be new or used, is unbelievable. Even the paperback books, we still have ways of getting some kind of contraband through there if we do so. Because all day long, all we do is sit around and think of ways to outdo the COs. So for one CO, there's a hundred of us. One CO can't do nothing with a hundred people. So a hundred people only have to think about the mentality of one person versus one person having to think about the mentality of a hundred. So those are some of the, the, the reasons why you have so much uh, tension, sort of, you know, problems in sending books. And hardback books can contain all kinds of contraband, from drugs, money, to uh, you name it, uh, stamps. All kinds of things can be hidden inside the hardcover. Now, one of the things that my focus is decarceration. And there are so many institutions that haven't a clue about what decarceration means. Decarceration means reversing the trauma of incarceration. When I first got out of prison, I worked in the juvenile, the little juvenile prison on Milton Street. I'm the first one incarcerated to ever work inside that facility. And as a result of my, my work ethics and my decarceration uh, process, I was able to open doors for other formerly incarcerated to work in that facility. But let me make sure that I'm very clear. When I say decarceration, if you've been in prison, even if it's only been for 30 days, your mind is dehumanized. So if you incarcerate a person you must decarcerate them. And it doesn't matter what age, the younger is better because you have to teach them the skills to decarcerate because if you don't, they can read all the books in the world. But if they're not learning how to decarcerate, you, you, it's going to, you're only setting them up to, for recidivism because you can give me all the, 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 the classes, you can be the best institution in the world. But when I go back out in the real world in my environment where everybody's doing drugs and my mama beats me and my daddy rapes me, all kinds of things, I'm faced with a whole nother environment that your institution has not prepared me for. So through the decarceration program, the decarceration, you prepare these young people and old people to survive in society right now prison don't do that they teach us how to be good inmates 
how to follow the rules, what to do in prison, but they don't teach us how to survive in society. That's why we keep coming back because we don't know how to survive in society. So the books is very, very important to us because I was, a, as an inmate, books to prison, I could almost say save my life, but I didn't, they only allowed us to read novels in prison. I could read all the romance stories that I wanted to read. I could read all the foolishness that I wanted to read, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted books on business, I wanted religious books, spiritual books, self-motivation. I wanted books that was going to change my life. I wrote the, my business plan in, in prison. I wrote the concept of sister hearts in prison. And I did all my business transactions from prison. So when I got out of prison, I started my business, did the nonprofit. And then within three years, I took $40 and built an empire. And that's what my movie's about. That's what the book's about. That's what all my success is about because I was able to show society what a decarcerated mind looks like after prison. So that's it. Thank you so much for that and for sharing your story with us because you're amazing and everything you're doing is amazing. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so happy that you're here with us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, and so the next thing that I'm wondering too is like, who makes these decisions about what is and isn't allowed? Um, especially Susanna for, for adult prisons, like who, is there like a committee? Is this the, like, who, who makes these decisions about what to ban and whatnot? Is it, is it just like you're saying the male person just decides what goes through? That seems to be what it, what it is. Um, yeah, let me know when you find out. Uh, no, um, the, uh, I mean, the, the state department of justice is, are, are making, you know, decisions about lists, you know, for states that, that have that. But yeah, as I mentioned before, a lot of it just comes down to who's working the mailroom at a particular facility on a particular day. Um, yeah. and yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we do our best to just try to, um, you know, send things that are are not going to, uh, you know, that are likely to get through. You know, we we try to, um, you know, look at the cover. Uh, we flip through all, you know, any used books we send, we flip through and make sure there's nothing in them. Um, I know, uh, uh, just to address, um, something Miriam said about about contraband, and I know that um, uh, while that that um, that is true, what you said, but also like you know, coming from a prison book program like ours or or any number of them, like we're not connected with people who we're sending books to, so like the the connection of us sending something. You know, there's not that link that we would be sending something to someone. So, um, uh, and in addition, like uh, usually, I think um, a lot of times the books are X-rayed um, at the facility, uh, depending on the on the place they're going. But um, I just so just they're different, you know, kind of stop gaps. But in terms of who's making decisions, uh, yeah, it does seem pretty pretty much up to the individual facilities for the i mean it's impossible for people to memorize this whole list and then if they're getting you know dozens of books like the actual labor to check books against an elaborate list that's listing you know a certain edition of a book you know and a page number that has a <laughs> you know a a suggestive image on it or something so um but yeah, I'll just stop there. Yeah, the, the list that I found online was like 34 pages long of what is banned. So there's just no way that they will check that, all 34 pages. And it was weird to me because like, you can't read Game of Thrones, but Mein Kampf isn't on that list, right? <laughs> and, um, and things like, you know, I noticed that a lot of graphic novels and like RPG tabletop uh, books 
and magazines, you know, like Glamour and Newsweek and Rolling Stone, which, you know, now that Byron said about the news, maybe that's, that's, you know, explains that. But it just seems like a lot of like printed materials with pictures uh, are, are on this list. And also like things about like anti-racism and social justice and, you know, a lot of books by black authors are all on this list. And it's like, like why, like why are these things seen as a threat to security um, in, in these in these situations, and um, and I, I guess it's it's very different in the juvenile system where it just seems to be like education. If we could if we can roll it in there, I love that that you're creative with that. Um, but is it different with graphic novels and things like that, Byron? So, um, not really. So, okay. so what what the facilities does they don't provide the manpower to take time out to actually counsel or work with the inmates to explain about the different books and the different topics you know you don't want to put uh they so one of the books they don't allow is like um swim swimwear you know um ladies in swimsuits because you know they constituted as being porn what we do from a school side is is teach the kids the value of the books so instead of us saying you can't have the book at all what we try to do is get them to understand and actually see the value of the book and what the pictures are actually saying and what they're portraying so that's why i say we we Within the school, our autonomy is a little different. We're a little rogue, so we gamble and, you know, we do other things. And the good thing is, too, even up at OJC, the adult facility, we operate the same in the same manner that we do in the juvenile facility when it comes to the books and the education. And even more so with those guys, because a lot of those guys haven't been in school in five or six years. They're older. Um so what what we do is here at Travis Hill, I also have a Travis Hill rise component, which means any kid that is enrolled in Travis Hill, whether it's the juvenile facility or adult facility, we I have social workers and I have case workers that work with them while they're in. And then once they're released, they're doing the same work. So we connect them to uh, mental health services. We connect them to jobs. We connect them back into school. We do um, work training. And uh, I got a guy who does C-Tech with some of these guys. So, you know, we try to we try to do the, the whole gambit of receiving them when they come in and trying to walk with them when they leave. Uh, we even go as far as working with the parents because a lot of people don't know these kids, whether they're juveniles or adults, don't have the relationship with their parents like folks think they do. So what we do is we do um, circles with parents and students to mend that relationship while they're incarcerated. So that way, when they go out, they have like a better working relationship with their parents. Some of these kids are homeless because they don't have a relationship with their parents. So, you know, we try to do our best to repair whatever it is that's not working for them and to try to set them up as best as possible when they come out into the community. Good, and Miss Miriam, um, I know you have a different perspective on this as well. Um, what What is your perspective on this, like about things with pictures like graphic novels or magazines or these like social justice books, why they may not allow them? Okay, well, I need to just understand what is the difference in you saying that an inmate can't have a pictures of a woman in a in a bathing suit or skimpy clothes, but your your, your correction officers that are females, they can walk around in skin tight uniforms with all they behind showing every every dimple in their butt exposed, their breasts is the shirt so tight that they have to put a pin to hold the shirt together. They have their makeup on, their hair is done, they're now, they are walking examples of what sex is. And then when they get in front of the guys, they put an extra twist inside their walk to entice them and to literally seduce them 
and you have them right there live. And as soon as the guys look at them a little too long, then you want to beat them down, put them in solitary confinement because they looked at a female or they're having all these thoughts in their minds. And then they go to a little corner and try to do what people do to release that pressure. Now you want to be, what's the difference? I think that's entrapment if you want to ask me, but nobody asked me, but I think it's entrapment. That's what I feel about the the, the porn thing because I feel like a lot of the COs are, 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 are porn magnets, but this is what my biggest concern. My focus is decarceration, whether you're in the juvenile or the adult. If you put, you can give them school, you can call their mom and daddy, you can do whatever you want to do. But if you are not dealing with that child's decarceration, that child is going to eventually, maybe not all of them, come back to prison because there is a trauma as an inmate. We're not going to tell mama about daddy, sister. I'm not telling the COs. I'm not telling your mental health people. I'm not telling nobody because I feel like your psychiatrist and all them people, you've never been to prison. You don't know what it feels like. You can't walk in my shoes. So you, I'm, I'm basically just a puppet. When you go to school as a counselor and social worker and all them people, they are not specifically trained to handle the trauma of incarceration. Nobody, they're not, they do not train them for that. Nobody has taught me since I've been out of prison how to deal with the fact that I got my teeth knocked out, got my shoulder knocked out of place, fractured ribs, got raped, all while under the custody of custody and control where I was supposed to have been in a safe place, but I received so much abuse and outright torture that the Baton Rouge Sheriff's Department took me out of the custody of DOC. So with all that said, there is no agencies that has helped me to reverse that trauma. So if it were not for my own decarceration program, I would still be suffering and I'm still suffering. I'm suffering every day, but I have worked, wrote a workbook and it, I don't know if they're going to let it in or not, but it is being taught at Hunts and there's three other guys that wants to have, teach it in their prison. But I understand we have to get the facilitators and the prison to buy in to the decarceration program, but it's so successful at Hunts that Well, I think Miss Miriam may have frozen up there. <laughs> so hopefully she comes back in a second. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to talk. There was a question um, actually that was placed by an audience member that I actually had as well, because I've talked to Susanna about this in the past, trying to donate fantasy books to books to prisoners. Um, and maps are not allowed, like even fictional fantasy maps if there is a if there's a map drawn in the book um they're they're not allowed so can we talk about this and that was a question from the audience like what about the prohibition on maps like what's up with that why <laughs> do you have insight into that Susanna um well I mean I guess you know there's some basis in like well well, you know, it could be an escape map or a map of, you know, some, you know, the air conditioning vents or something like, I don't know, like that, that this stems from that might come from a rational place. Um, but yeah, like the, the people working in the mailroom are not going to be like analyzing what, what the map is. It's like, oh, no maps, you know, and so it, it could go out and uh, it it's possible it might get through, but we get those sent back frequently, even for uh, fantasy um, worlds. Uh, so we we just have limited, um, you know, we'll, we'll tear out the page or uh, if possible, you know. And so that that's really limiting to uh, history books. Um, yeah, fantasy books. Uh, I can't remember which state has banned the Klingon dictionary, um, I guess, for, for similar reasons, like communicating in some 
uh, you know, but you know, we're just you know guessing the the rationale behind behind the rules when there yeah, is and our, when there is one. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I, you know, it is, I mean, I, as a sci-fi fantasy store, I, I've just experienced it with fantasy. There's Miss Miriam. Hey, so back. My, my, my high school just died on me. I'm so oh, no. it, 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 I, I apologize. Oh, it's okay. But like I was trying to say, I'm so sorry. But what okay. I was saying was that the decarceration concept is so extremely important to the success of any of any penal institution that once it starts to take over, this country is going to be on the map because as soon as you incarcerate a person, you instantly should start working on the decarceration process in order to reduce the recidivism and crime. Because if you have trouble, when the judge sentenced us to prison, he don't sentence us to prison to be beaten and misused and raped and all. That's not part of my sentence. But when that stuff takes place, the administrators, they cannot always control what is happening to us because they're not there with us 24 hours a day. So whether you put me in the best programs in your prison, it doesn't matter. If I am not a favorite of the guard, which I was not a favorite, you guys have no idea what they do to us. So when we get out of prison, we're so ashamed that we don't want to tell anybody what happened to us. And you, you, the youth with the young people, they rape in prison too because their their little hormones and testosterone or whatever you call it is running all over the place. And, and, and they don't have no girls. Or they, so they're just as deadly as a full grown man in prison. And that when a kid gets raped in prison, they're not gonna always tell. You know, I know I didn't. I was so ashamed. I never said a word. So I'm just okay, I know I detoured a little bit, but I'm just saying we need decarceration. And I think with the decarceration process, like with the workbook that I've written, I've written that workbook since I've been out of prison and is working through a lot of the trauma. But I need administrators to be able to allow the, the 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 workbook to go into the prison, and then we also need to train the inmates to teach it. I'm only one person. I'm 64 years old. I'm not going to be here forever. So we need to train the the inmates to teach the, the program instead of hiring uh, people from the street. That doesn't. That's not going to work for the decarceration. We have to have those that have walked a mile in my shoes. And so the institutions, they have to train their inmates to teach the newcomers and old timers. They have to train us to it's like teach, train the trainers. And you have to do that. So that's what I was trying to say, guys. Sorry. No, thank you very much. And um, and it and it's just yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's horrible that there's no, you know, like, like getting people back out into the world. There's no, you know, it's like, we just release people back onto the street and then good luck to you. You know, there is no, there's no like help with that. And so I think what you're doing is so, so important. Um, and, and just very much appreciate that. And, um, and let's talk a little bit about access, which I think this was, this was actually another question, but it was also a question that I had for you um, about access. And because I, I, I also see a lot that uh, prison libraries, they'll say like, oh, well, well, you know, incarcerated people have access to the, the prison library, even if, you know, they're not getting whatever books are being sent. But from what I know, or from what I, I was able to read, live, the prison libraries are like very underfunded, very, um, you know, not, they don't have a whole lot in there. So I wanted to get all of your takes on that um, and, and what prison libraries look like, why they aren't sufficient and what the true access situation is. Ask the question first, how many of people on the panel have been inside of a prison library. Minus you, Mr. Byron, because I know you work in the facility, so you can go to the library. Or well, Mr. Byron, how many times have you been into the library, sat down, went through the books, and tried to find something of interest to you? Okay, now let's just answer that question now. Plenty of times. 
plenty okay. of time. And and the the goal of the facilities is to put books in the library that are not interesting to the inmates. That's the that's the goal. Um, so what we have done is we our library is fully stacked. Um, so we get books from you, Liz, you know, week after week. So we are our library is, is very plentiful. So what we have started doing is because we have students on different tiers at the adult facility, um, we allow them to check out books from the school. Um, so it kind of circumvents the facility library because it's really not manned. Um, what they have started doing at OJC is they have hired a team that does push carts around with books. So they're now starting to do like the religious books, um, some of the same books we're doing. Um, I think we were kind of that push because one of the things I did was, you know, you got the, 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 the gentlemen who are actually Muslims that actually practice. Um, they wouldn't give them their mats. They wouldn't give them their hats. They wouldn't provide those things. So I would actually buy these things when they ask and provide it to them. Since then, now the facility is starting to do it a little bit here and there. But if they ask, I would actually go out and buy it and provide it. I mean, because it's it's part of their rights, you know, and, you know, we it's still part of their healthy living, which is also trying to help them change themselves once they come back out here. And the, the issue is that they are trying to find something constructive to do and to be involved in. And the religion is a big piece. But when they have them roadblocks, then they wonder why that they're wilding and why are they doing all these things? Because you're not giving them the tools that will help them settle their mind. And, you know, so, so yeah, the libraries are far and few outside of the school. But yeah. uh, 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 on that too, Mr. Mr. Uh, Byron, they're not called mats; they're called prayer rugs. Yes, the prayer rugs. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and um, and you know, like like you were saying, Byron, it, it is it's a right, right? Like access to literature is a First Amendment right. So, um, you know, these this this right, this widespread censorship and like these extreme efforts to restrict what incarcerated folks read is a violation of the first amendment just straight up um and so it just it, it it's you know in theory incarcerated people still have their first amendment rights but in reality uh these are all all the things that are that are happening to just you know ha restrict access yeah and 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 the the other thing too is they also fight these guys on even having their paperwork from their court hearings. Yes. You, you know, they, they, you, you're in court, the judge tell you it's yours. You can take it with it. Your attorney give it to you. You get back to the facilities. You got to find it because they take everything you walk through and it's like pulling tooth and nail for them to get copies of their work. Attorneys are sending it, but it's not getting to the, the, the inmates, you know? And so now you have inmates in there, trying to keep up with their cases, trying to keep up what's going on. And so they do, so, you know, so the books is, is, is one thing, but they also deny them the right to be able to keep their actually court papers, which they're supposed to have, because if they decide at any given time not to have an attorney and want to represent themselves, they're supposed to have that. They're supposed to have access to law books. So they're supposed to have access to all those things. They get it, but it you you it it takes a act of Congress for them to actually have access to it. Yeah, and that's it, it's it's just wild, you know. It's like we we don't like all these things are just it's just it's just wild. Mm -hmm. um, and I I feel like I, also uh, what Susanna was saying earlier 
about these like vendor programs, right? That, um, it, you know, where it's about money, where it's just like, okay, you, these three vendors or whatever can send books in. And there's a lot of like hoops to jump through. Like if a family member wants to send a book to somebody, um, they have to go through all these weird hoops. Like if they, it's, it's easier if, for example, they get it to me and it comes from a bookstore to, it's more likely to get in there than it is coming from the family member directly or going through books to prisoners. I think that's why books to prisoners is so important. Um, but Susanna, what about, what about you? What do you have to say about all of this stuff? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in many instances, families, uh, you're not allowed to receive books from, from individuals. So we're like the only, like groups like ours are the only option. Um, the, yeah, which makes it, makes it really important. And the same, you know, with, um, providing a, a prayer rug, like that, that's like a separate thing, but, but related, you know, to, to religious books, um, you, you can't bring that with you and a family member can't send it to you. So somebody has to provide it. Like how, how can that happen? Um, and so we've actually, we've had requests <laughs> for that before also, but it, it is, it would be a lot of, um, a lot of hoops to, to get, um, get beyond a lot of the red tape working through that. Um, uh, in terms of libraries, you know, I've not been in a prison library, um, but in reading thousands of letters um, sent to books to prisoners over the last several years, um, comments I've read, um, you know, within letters of book requests are um, that there's uh, there's not a librarian right now, so we don't have access to the books. Uh, our library was flooded at some point and hasn't reopened. Um, the The books were damaged. Uh, we uh, don't have any new books. I've read all the books in the library. You know, these are things that we hear about the inadequacies of, of the library. Um, a lot of comments on just like there being insufficient books or everything being very dated. Um, and, you know, a lot of people who receive books uh, then donate them to the library there or share them with other, um, other people they're incarcerated with. Um, uh, but then, you know, we get letters like, oh, I had books, but um, uh, when I came back from the infirmary, they were all gone. You know, my, my things were taken. So a lot of, you know, needing replacements of things they've already requested, like a dictionary or um, just basic, basic books. So, yeah, there's definitely not adequate um, books provided at facilities. That's not a, a we, we might have this imagined you know, great prison library resource from, from some film we saw in the seventies, but it's not, <laughs> it's just doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. And from what I've seen in, in reading some letters too, and volunteering or doing different things is too, that like a lot of the books in the library, a lot of time are outdated. Like they're from, they're from, you know, the 1970s or whatever, and it's just not relevant anymore. Um, and you know, a lot of officials, when you push them on this stuff, will say, oh, but the library, you know, they kind of fall back on that as an excuse. And, um, and it's just, it's not good enough. for right? We need to, so, uh, so what are all of you have advocacy efforts? Um, so I want to hear more about th those and what your advocacy efforts to expand, um, what incarcerated folks are, are allowed to read and, and what other types of advocacy efforts are you working on? Well, I'll Ms. jump Miriam, right in. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, at Sister Heart Stewart Store, we're the largest Stewart Store in St. Bernard Parish. And what we do is, well, every, but first of all, to work there, you have to have been to prison. We discriminate, okay? And unapologetically, I, we discriminate because there, you have to have been to prison in order to work there. So that's the first thing. But when society comes in to support us and patronize us, and I ask everybody, because I'm so transparent, I'm like, look, you got somebody in prison, you've ever been to prison before? I normalize the conversation when I know it's not normal in this society. And when they tell me that they have a loved one, I say, well, I need their DOC number. And then I start taking 
their DOC number. And as that those family members make purchases at the store, the money they save, I send to the inmate. Like today, there was a guy, I don't know, I don't even remember his name, but his daddy was in the store and he's, he's bought several big pieces of furniture. So what we did was we said, hey, your dad shopped with us and here's a donation for you. And being an inmate, that is the most wonderful feeling to get money from a total stranger. So that person knows that their family is remembering them. It is one of the most transforming decarceration methods that you could ever imagine happening. So what we're doing is we're helping to decarcerate while they're still incarcerated. And then we're incorporating society, the community, our customer, our customers and their family in the process of them decarcerating while they're incarcerated. And so, you know, we're just, you know, it, I mean, it's really a phenomenal uh, movement that's taking place because society, people, the community, the customers, they're beginning to talk about decarceration and they're beginning to ask their loved ones, well, are you institutionalized? Well, a lot of us will say, no, I'm not institutionalized, but that's a lie. We are institutionalized because I'm institutionalized and I am very successful, but I'm still institutionalized and I need to decarcerate in order to be a better, more productive citizen and an asset in society. So that's what Sister Heart does. We focus on decarceration and helping to reverse the trauma of incarceration. And we try to give light to those that are, are institutionalized and let them know that it is not all the negative that society tries to make it out to be. Because there's no way you could be in prison 5, 10, 15, 30 years and not be affected. And so that's what Sister Heart does. Yay, and everybody, uh, uh, Megan had put a banner up, so everyone uh, go go to the website. It's, it's sisterhearts.org um, and go check that out as well. And uh, I'm sure that there's more info there if folks want to donate or, or help out. And uh, okay, Byron, um, what about what are y'all's advocacy efforts there? I know you told us about what you do, but um, are y'all advocating, you know, to what, what so, else? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so we do a lot of advocating. So we, most of our kids are um, what they would call special ed. Um, so they, they have some type of trauma, some type of component. So we advocate for them to, be we we teach them basically to advocate for themselves so all our kids that have ieps um our kids write their own ieps because we found that when adults write kids iep it's not what the kid really wants to say so what we do is we allow them to create powerpoints and allow them to present their own ieps so when they leave our facilities and they go back to their home schools they were able to pull up their PowerPoint, present their 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 plans, present their 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 goals, and they're able to talk and tell the schools what their needs are. Um, we also do a lot of adv uh, advocating for kids when they're going home, uh, working with their families, uh, trying to help them better their situations. Uh, most of the time, it's like guiding parents to the right resources uh, because. You know, there's resources out here, but the resources are not getting to the areas where they need to get. Uh, so we do we do a lot of juvenile awareness um, with with our families and with the with our kids and with the schools. That's amazing. And just for those, if you if you don't know what an IEP is, it's an, an individual education plan, right? right? <laughs> okay. Um, so there there you go. Um, and, and, and Megan is putting in the chat that it's basically an individualized plan for students who have any kind of special learning needs. Right. Um, and, and also, so it's two, you have that. And you also, we have a lot of kids that's gifted. So they have IEPs for gifted. So whether it's, it's talented in arts, music, uh, poetry, whatever it is, we have a lot of kids. You, you'll be amazed at the amount of kids that we have that have IEPs, but on the talented side. 
Awesome. And Susanna, what about books to prisoners? Like we know clearly it's in the name that, that you're you're getting books to prisoners, but what about your other advocacy efforts specifically? Yeah, well, really, we're just trying to send books to people who are incarcerated. And uh, we don't, uh, you know, we're, we want to, we really just want to be like librarians where people send us a letter with a request and we send them books. Um, and, uh, you know, we all do it for various reasons, but, um, but you know, to, to make life a little easier for people on the inside, um, to uh, keep connection with, you know, people on the outside. And, uh, uh, but it's really hard. Like uh, the advocacy, advocacy, any advocacy we do is just stemming from trying to send books to people who are incarcerated. You know, we're, we're constantly, um, uh, you know, watching trends across the country, moving toward tablets, not allowing groups like ours to send books. Um, you know, we get banned uh, from sending to various facilities, you know, frequently uh, because they've decided to only allow books from Amazon or, um, you know, whatever thing is happening there. And, you know, we're not necessarily part of that conversation. So we, we do try to um, try to fight those uh, when we can, or um, at least, you know, um, see if there's any, any way to, to work around it, um, like sending only new books to Angola is, uh, is one, you know, one thing we do. But um, yeah, I mean, personally, we all uh, keep, you know, keep an eye on what's happening in other states, um, especially uh, because uh, the trends trends will will follow. So. It's really interesting to me how large of a part capitalism plays in this. Um, I, I mean, of course, we live in a capitalistic society, um, but it is, it's just insidious everywhere. Right? <laughs> it's like, you know, like you say, well, we'll only allow from Amazon or we'll only allow from these certain vendors or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's just it's it's all very just mind blowing to me. <laughs> Someone who deal who is like my whole life is books, um, you know, to to, to have this happening. It's, it's just, it's completely ridiculous. Um, and so how can people like me and, and people like the people watching, um, how can we help? How can we help to create change? What can we do um, to, you know, I don't, I don't know, do anything about any of this. What are, what are some things that we can do? Okay. One thing for, for, for Suzanne, Suzanne, I want you to know that, at the store, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds of books. So what I need you to do maybe later is get with me and I can start gathering some of the books at the store for for the inmates. And I know you guys have warehouses full of books, but I, I would like for you to know that we are definitely a great, I am definitely a great supporter and staff at Sister Hearts. You know, we do whatever we can do for people that are incarcerated because those are our peers. So please give us an opportunity to be a blessing to someone. And then I wanted to also share with Byron because I can feel his, his wheels is rolling going on. Byron, anytime you need me to come to the school to uh, do a presentation and to share with the young people, I want you to know that I am willing to uh, be open to that suggestion. Ms. Ms. Mary, I got two graduations coming up and I was supposed to find a speaker. So <laughs> I will I will get in touch with you before the week is out. All right. I look forward to it. <laughs> Amazing. And if I can help any of you at the bookstore, uh, I have lots of access to books. I know Ms. Miriam has tons of books. Um, so, yeah, if there's anything that I can do as well, um, you know, I already work with books to prisoners. Um, fairly regularly. Uh, we also work with the Juvenile Justice Center um, for, you know, just get giving books. Like I just shove books out the door if I can um, and also help with fundraisers and like just whatever, whatever we can do. So yes, let it, let's all help each other for sure. Um, and of course, folks watching, you've seen all the websites for 
um, for all these organizations, for Sisters Hearts, for Travis Hill, for Louisiana Books to Prisoners. Um, and you can go to those websites, you can donate, you can volunteer, you can find out ways, I'm sure, there that you can help as well. And if anyone else, I think we have maybe 10 more minutes. So if anyone has any questions, post them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, because I, I am running out. We, we have talked about like all the things I wanted to talk about. So I'm, I'm like really grateful for that. Um, but yeah, I just, the, the one thing for sure, when I was, when I was reading this 34 page, I was like scrolling through this 34 page list of banned books. Um, and it was just mind blowing to me that like things like all of the game of Thrones books are banned and like dungeons and dragons, but again, like mind Kampf isn't on there and things like that. And so it's just like, okay, so people can't read the Bible, but people can read Nazi stuff. Like it just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't make any sense to any of you, but no. yes. it was just like, I was reading this. And I was like, this just makes absolutely no sense at all whatsoever. Um, so uh, yeah, we have, we've, we've had a lot of really good comments here about, um, folks who have just been enjoying the conversation and um, loving the word decarcerate, which I do too, Ms. Marion. I'm going to start, I'm going to start using that for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And you know what, Candace, let me share something with you. Yes. I would be so grateful if you would do that. And you know why? Because those of us that are suffering from incarceration, we need to hear that word because that word gives us hope. It's like, now I know what's wrong with me. Now I know why I keep going to prison. Now I understand why I keep doing the, the criminal, the, the having the criminal thoughts that I'm having. Now I understand. Up until I developed this concept of decarceration, I didn't have a clue why when I go to Walmart, something triggers in my brain, I want to go steal something. And with, and with thousands of dollars in my pocket, why do you want to do that? But that's the trauma that I didn't have a clue that I was dealing with. And those are the things that they don't teach us. So please, anytime you can use the word decarcerate, especially around a person who has been incarcerated, please do. I absolutely will. And hopefully those watching will as well. Um, and we have another question from Liz. So the move to tablet entertainment, does it include eBooks? And what's the cost to individuals? Does it completely eliminate the access to physical books? How how is that working with tablets and ebooks? And I'm curious about that for the juvenile um, system as well. If they're if ebooks and and tablets are becoming more of a thing. So in the juvenile facility, they're they're still doing regular hard paper books. Uh, books online is good. But when you're dealing with youngsters, it's better to put a book in their hand um, because then it kind of helps them and teach them and trains them that when they're out, they can pick up a newspaper, they can pick up a book. So we, we, we still believe in the old fashion of being able to put that book in their hand and, and it allows them to read it when they want to read it, read what they want to read. So no, we, we're very much for the old fashioned way. But Mr. Bar uh, Mr. Byron, I want to add something to that. And I don't know if uh, and if there are any uh, facilitators uh, looking on. What I have come to learn is that a lot of us don't know how to read. So our behavior, we we behave very bad. When I say we, I'm talking about inmates. Yes, and as a former one, we behave very badly to camouflage and to cover up that that vulnerability we don't know how to read. And when you put a book in our hand, sometimes that book is so overwhelming and so intimidating, we just would rather go fight or do something criminal than to try to read because we've been getting kicked out of school since we were kids. So we never really learned how to read. Now we're 50 and 60 years old and we still don't really know how to read. So I wanted to put that on the table and I wanted to let you know that sometimes to send a, 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 a older person a second or third grade book is not always a bad thing because sometimes that's really the grade level that they're on. And the same thing with the, the young people too. They're not always on a level where they can actually read. 
Yeah. So, so what we do is when they come in, we do, we do testing and we test them for their, for their math and their reading level. We get a lot of them that are not on a reading level at all. So what we do is as we test them, we provide the work that's according to their level and group them with other kids that are at that same level. Because what we find is that if I put you in a group where they're so advanced, then you feel lost and you feel like I don't want to participate. So what we've learned is that we put them in their groups. So we do, we have reading, a reading block for an hour every day where all we do is read books. And you either going to end up in a group where you are reading a book or you might be in a group where the teacher's reading and doing the question and answer. But what that does is that when these kids are then back in their regular classes, it makes them feel comfortable because we are actually developing and growing their reading skills. But you are absolutely right. The biggest um, thing that kids do in school is act out. And they act out because of those reasons. I can't read. I can't add. I can't do these things. And instead of us as a community and the school taking the time to recognize that and to say, hey, this kid is not just cutting up to be cutting up. Let me find out what the actual reason is. And if we ever ask that question, we'll have a lot of kids that won't be suspended, won't end up on the street because we can put the resources into trying to help to develop them and make them better. So you are absolutely right about that. I love that. I, I need an hour block every day for myself to read. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, thank you all so very much. This was an amazing conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved hearing all of your stories and about all of your organizations. And I truly hope that everyone watching goes and, and looks up these organizations, um, looks looks at the website and, and sees what you can do to help because it is one banned books week. Um, and, you know, the it, books are banned for so many completely ridiculous reasons. So, um, so go and, and check these organizations out and, and see what you can do to help. And, uh, and of course, yay books, because that's why we're here. Um, so thank you all so very much. I believe that Liz is going to come back and, and tell us good night and then tell us what's next for Obono. So take it away, Liz. Thank you. Hi, Liz, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll take it from the top. Um, thank you so much to Candace, Miriam, Susanna, Byron. Um, that was incredible. And it was really riveting to hear the different perspectives of an educator, a formerly incarcerated individual, a book supplier, and a bookseller to really understand the value and importance of free and open access to information and of course that ongoing struggle to ensure freedom to seek and express ideas and keep up with all these different lists and decision makers um, from the person opening the mail oh my goodness to um, those running these various institutions so each one of you is doing such amazing and absolutely critical work. And we are just so grateful to you for sharing your insight, your passion, and your experiences with us for Band Behind Bars. So coming up, um, October 5th, One Book, One New Orleans will be giving away free books at the Lower Ninth Ward Night Out Against Crime. It's going to be a community gathering from 5 to 7 p.m. at the corner of Tennessee Street and North Prier. 
in the lower nine. It's an outdoor event. Masking and social distancing are encouraged. So come on by, get some books, and we'd love to see you there. And of course, keep an eye on our Facebook page for upcoming events and opportunities to connect. And once again, thank you all for being a part of Band Behind Bars, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Peace.